Welcome to Collector Car Podcast. Today is all about Concord judging, and I've got a fun guest. I've got Tim McNair. Tim, how are you doing today? Great. I appreciate that. You know, it's funny because uh, we're on Zoom, so if, if you're listening to audio only, you got to go over to YouTube and check out the Zoom. Tell me about your background screen. You said you're going down US-1. Oh, yeah. Actually, this is uh, <clears throat> this is our tradition. Uh, every year going to Monterey, I meet my friend in San Francisco, who's got various collector cars. This particular instance is uh, driving a 330 GTS Ferrari down Route 1 down the coast to Monterey about a week before the event. So okay. we take Skyline Drive off of uh, out of San Francisco, and we all meet at a restaurant in Pescadero called Duarts. It's all tradition every year, but this is probably my 15th year doing it. <clears throat> and then uh, we were just fortunate enough to have good weather that day and uh, had the 330 out and just a fantastic trip down. But it was one of those magic pictures that, you know, I, I just kept in my in my archives i just say it makes a great background well it's pretty funny because yeah because for those are are audio only it's a picture of us1 and on the right hand side is the ocean obviously and you got the cliffs on the left hand side and you got the hood of the ferrari in front of you so from a zoom perspective it looks like you're riding on the hood <laughs> yeah, pretty much yeah i i almost was actually to get that shot so <laughs> Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's, as I said, it's our tradition and, uh, it's just something we do every year. It's fun. And, uh, sometimes it's a Ferrari. Sometimes it's a rental car. Just that, this year, that year it worked out really well. So that's awesome. Well, I appreciate you joining me to talk about Concord judging. We're going to kind of take this as a, you know, for one of my listeners that knows nothing about Concord judging, give us kind of the one oh one from the ground up. But before we do that, I wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about your history in the automotive world and how you got involved in Concord judging. Sure. Well, I've been doing, uh, <clears throat> I've been into cars all my life. Basically, I had a subscription to road and track when I was 10. Uh, when I was 15, 16, I was already starting to work on cars. And I had a small friend of mine help me out with a little detailing business we were running at the time. And uh, eventually, uh, that morphed into doing almost everything in the car world mm. uh i've um, restored 300 sl mercedes oh not an uh, easy one <laughs> nope uh, i've done uh, i've actually been a, i'm a mercedes tech by trade trained uh at mercedes factory and also with uh, lotus uh from there uh, i've done everything in the car business from sales to service to accessories to insurance working for Allstate in a total loss and special investigative unit oh wow yeah. So, but uh, all that time working in various jobs and going through, you know, life changes and marriage and two kids and everything else, uh, I've always had a side business of doing cars, uh, detailing cars. That uh, 18 years ago, I stopped it. I stopped working all my other jobs and focused specifically on doing collector cars and show cars. So <clears throat> I'm doing, so that led me into where I am now, which is having worked on probably some of the greatest cars of all time. Uh, I've worked on more than 30 McLaren F1s. I've worked on two wow. or actually three 250 GTOs, uh, 250 LM, you name it, any kind of major car. Everything from an 1885 Duryea up to, um, I'm doing a Rolls-Royce right now, 24 Rolls-Royce for um, preservation class at Pebble Beach this year. So. Um, and everything 1924, in 1924, yes. not 2024. 1924, yeah. <laughs> so it's really cool. What's what's uh, fascinating too is just the uh, the various scope. I mean, I, I literally some of the cars I've done, I've only dreamed about even seeing, let alone working on. Every kind of exotic, they're they're pretty anymore. They're just commonplace in my world, and um, it just uh, it became a great thing. Uh, and with that, uh, I always thought. <clears throat> Since I do, I'm specifically focusing on Concord preparation at this point. So I became a judge uh, about 18 years ago. I'm sorry, uh, about uh, longer than that, probably 30 years ago at this point. I had a friend of mine that we have a small car show here in the Philadelphia area, the New Hope Auto Show, which is in its 20, I want to say 25th or 26th year now. And um, I was asked to, he, he needed help judging cars. I was like, well, that sounds really cool. Well, then the more I thought about it, the more I thought how much of an impact becoming a judge would make on my business, because it certainly lends credibility when you're prepping a car and you know what you're supposed to be looking at. Right. 
So with that, I joined the Ferrari Club, who has basically the the the, the base with the Ferrari Club, the um, their judging standards were all designed by Ed Gilbertson, who was at the time the uh, chief judge at Pebble Beach. So they have a, a really interesting form. There's three three sections to it, and they have uh, judging seminars and things like that where you actually learn. And uh, with all that. Uh, I, I went to the Ferrari Club and I also went to the AACA, which does the same thing. They have their judging forums. They have little judging classes that they do a couple times a year. And then it gives you the opportunity to judge at their events. And uh, that's how I really got into it. It became, it was just sort of like, a, hey, can you help us out? And then now becoming a, I'm a senior judge at Ferrari. I'm judging at Pebble Beach again this year. And uh, it's just become a fantastic uh, little side note. Uh, but in my business, I'm uh, being a Concord preparer, having the advantage of knowing what to look for and and bringing the scoring sheets to the car when I'm prepping it makes a big difference. Sure, <laughs> it's a, just a little bit of credibility to the owner, so it's good. What's amazing though, like your business kind of ramps up, it, it goes so well tandem, hand in hand, because you know I take a Concord judge, like say myself, who has been digging into the cars, that kind of stuff. But I've never gone to the level you have from a body, from a paint, from a minute detail perspective. When I tried to schedule this before, you were dry icing something. And I'm like, well, I've never dry iced anything. So like your level of knowledge when you see that paint or that body or whatever, you know, that's just X, you know, because you've had so many years doing that at such a high level. I really need to just follow you and just tell me, hey, tell me what your eyes are seeing on this car, you know, because I think even if someone does a great job, I think you have the eyes from, you know, 18 years, 30 years of experience in the business to really kind of take it up a notch. So that's really cool. I can see how those totally go hand in hand together. Well, it's it's sort of a blessing and a curse, because if I that's walk true. around a show field now, uh, you know, I'm expecting a certain level of car and uh I see things that people don't. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, especially when it comes to paint and fit and finish and things like that, because it's this is what I do every day. So I may see a quarter panel that's a shade off and the other judges may not pick up on it. So it's just a that's why we always work as teams. We can, I may see something that you don't and vice versa. So it works out really well. All right. Uh, yeah. But I've seen some really bad work, even at cars uh, <laughs> that are like uh, for a while there, the. Uh, uh, the trend was to over restore the car. So you're seeing a car as a Pebble Beach about 15 years ago where they would come out in the uh, 20s or 30s Rolls Royce would have paint that looked like a bar top, you know, be mm. three inches of clear on top. And, you know, this is stuff that never happened in the real world back then when they restored the car. The trend now is to go back to what the car was as originally delivered. Um, for a while you couldn't get lacquer paints now your lacquer is available again so now you're seeing 50s 60s even 40s 50s cars being painted in lacquer again to get that warm only lacquer has feeling when they're restored you know instead of that that really plasticky wet look that that modern cars have that certainly aren't appropriate say on a you know a, fifth, a 60s ferrari so it's interesting you say that because the importance of how it was done originally is really, really uh, high profile. I mean, it's 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 only original once, right? You know, so when you're reproducing it, if you have an original car to reference, that's gold, right? And yes. I know of an instance. I won't say the car. I won't say the brand, but it's headed to Pebble, where it was the last one that had not been ever taken apart, and so mm -hmm. because it was being taken apart and it it was original. Um, the manufacturer actually flew over to document the process. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when a manufacturer is going through that kind of expense, because a lot of these manufacturers have their own classic department, right? You know, they want to be the experts of their own brand, which makes total sense. And, you know, they came over to document it as it's being disassembled because they didn't know what it was like, because they had never seen one before like that. So, you know, that level of detail is just really fascinating and it's a great trend to have because you want to preserve these cars and re you want to restore them back to as original as possible correct exactly and <clears throat> what i'm finding now is a lot of things that were done in the 70s and 60s uh, even the early 80s are now being re-restored to a better level um along the same 
minds. I've actually documented a number of cars that are totally original. <clears throat> the last one I did was a 4,000 mile uh, Ferrari Daytona Spider. Mm. So it's, again, it's only original once, it had the original tires, it had everything. One of the things we look for um, in the Mercedes world when I was doing 300 SLs is they did, um, <clears throat> finishes are really, really, really important. And a lot of the metal work in those cars and 50s cars, they used a, a white cadmium plating on all the hose clamps and nuts and bolts and screws. And a lot of that is really hard to reproduce now because of EPA regulations. So everything's being made in a zinc, which looks really bright. Um, they're now finding new methods to bring it back to that original style. And you, when you see a car that's properly restored that has the original finishes, that's part of the thing. You'd be amazed <clears throat> how many tones of black there are, mm. uh, especially in a 300 SL where the air box and the air filters are done, or air filter canister is done in a high gloss black. And then uh, around the engine compartment itself is a semi-gloss black, but it's only about a 75 to 80% semi-gloss. You know, it's like all these little, all those little things that make the difference when you're going for what is now essentially a million dollar car and you want to get it right. <clears throat> you want to get it right the first time. Yeah, it's um, interesting. Oh, go ahead. Finishes are everything. And like the Ferraris, the, the early Ferraris use black oxide, which we found a way of reproducing that that actually lasts. Because typically what happens is once engines assembled uh, and you get some tool marks on it, every tool mark becomes rusty. So this yeah. new stuff is actually a lot more durable. Um, and then you'll see uh, part of the problem we have now, though, with Classic A departments and Classic departments like Mercedes, as an example, they're doing their own restorations. And on a 300 SL, they're putting modern plated parts on their car. So in a, uh, as an example, the, the fuel injection lines, which are very complicated, come off the fuel pump and they go into the side of the, where the injectors are under the intake manifold. And they're very, there are all kinds of weird S shapes and stuff to fit in that area. Uh, so Mercedes reproduces them, which was good, except right. they were made in yellow cadmium plating, which didn't come out until the 60s. So right. <laughs> what you have to do is you have to buy them from Classic, then strip them, refinish them in white CAD so that they look appropriate, and then put them in the car. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's goofy stuff like that, but that's the difference between a 95-point car and a 100-point car. Yeah, it's really interesting. I have just just two stories kind of related to what you just said. I, one of my favorites is the 69 Voss 302. If you look on the back in between the brake lights, you have the blacked out area between the two. And if you look on the left hand side, it's nicely taped off. It's a straight line. You know, they taped it off. They sprayed it mm -hmm. on the right hand side. It's not that way. It's there's no tape. It's just loose. You know, it's just a loose, you know, spray yeah. can. And they finally figured out that what happened was is in the plant. That side, as it went down the conveyor belt, was against the wall, and the guys didn't <laughs> want to go through the headache of trying to tape it off. You know? Yeah, that's so, awesome. To be correct, you had to not do the right, or you know, one or the other, and and then tape off the left. The other one was I, I saw a restored original AC Cobra, an early one with the mm -hmm. uh, the leaf string, and he said the the restorer said the biggest headache with that car was half of the bolts and screws were made by Ford, the other half were English, mm -hmm. you know? And so it wasn't like, you know, you had five different kinds of bolts across the entire car. You know, it was like, well, we had to source these from here. We had, and, you know, strangely enough, it was the U.S. original NOS ones that were harder to find because I guess in England, oh, wow. they still make a lot of the same yeah. ones they made back in the 60s. So just fascinating stories, mm -hmm. you know, that you need to know, you know, in order to judge appropriately, you know, so. It, it is funny. There are some, some, really strange things I've discovered when doing some of these cars. Uh, I had taken apart a, a DB5 and the car was unrestored, had about 20 something thousand miles on it. The entire left side of the interior was done in slotted screws and the entire right side was done in Phillips. Oh my gosh. So they must've run out and they just right. put in what they had. And uh, yeah, it's one of those things I'll never forget. Uh, along those same lines, it's one of my, one of my favorite things I've ever seen in a car. I did an unrestored um, <clears throat> Bentley S2 Continental convertible, just a rare as they get. It was two-tone sand over, uh, sand over uh, sable or sable over sand, whatever the combination was, doesn't matter. Uh, but the car was uh, original lacquer, had been pulled out of literally a barn find. And um, one thing I'll never forget, car had under 20,000 miles. 
and it had never been taken apart. <clears throat> but every one of the screws in the interior lined up. So when you looked around the, wow. the windshield frame, they ran like this, then they went vertical and they went horizontal again. And then every screw in the dashboard, all the way across the doors, around the back of the trunk, you open the trunk lid and every screw holding the, the deck lid cover in place, all were completely straight. And people say, oh, they never did that. Well, I can tell you that, yes, they did. Especially <laughs> if, you were, if you were building that Bentley by hand and you were very proud of what you did, that is exactly what they were built like. You know, that, that attention to detail, it's kind of funny that, it's just another thing that I'm cursed with when I see when I see screws that go like cattywampus. They're <laughs> supposed to, be, to me, they're supposed to be straight, so it's all good. It makes me wonder if you know at the Bentley factory back in the day, there's like six guys working on these cars, and Stu over there makes them all straight. And then you got Stan over there that doesn't. You know, it's like, come on, guys. You know, <laughs> or if it was the standard across all of them. You know, I, I suspect that they were very proud of what they built. You know, yeah. they want it to be exactly the way they wanted it to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were master craftsmen. It wasn't like they were just, you know, guys building, you know, cheap vinyl seats on something. They were really taking their time and the wood finishing was over the top. Spectacular finishes on those cars. And uh, even the paintwork was exceptional. There were plenty of paint on it. It was all lacquer. And I was able to polish it back up and it you know, held a gloss. It was beautiful. Really cool car. I'm cursed by loving old 60s Mustangs, which are a pile of junk from build quality, you know, unfortunately, yeah. but I still love them. So I, I've done a lot of those, actually, <laughs> a lot of different ones. Uh, local place here to us that uh, has uh, quite a collection of racing Mustangs. I've worked on all their cars, uh, everything from a GT350 R and up. So in oh, fact, nice. I just did Chuck Cant Cantwell's uh, GT350 last really? year for the Rider Hunt Concours. Yeah. Nice. Of all things. Uh, uh, as an example, I you know, not to babble about this, but it's kind of funny. Uh, he he spent the entire day with me in the garage while I while I cleaned his car and polished it. And uh, the requirement was he had to tell me stories. So <laughs> I had to hear Chuck Cantwell. Of course, you know he was the he was the father of the GT three hundred and fifty R. So I heard all the stories working with Cal Shelby and then working with Penske later in life and in the Trans Am series. But he had great stories, and I just loved to while I was working with him. Much better than any radio, and you'll never be able to get that again. You know, that was really cool. Did he get along well with Shelby? Yeah, surprisingly. Well, he was the guy. I mean, he he presented the car and he was between, you know, um, you know, the the rest of the team. He was the team leader, basically. He was the he was the guy. So yeah. Interesting stories. I mean, I can't tell you. We don't have all day, but yeah, it's pretty cool. That'll be yeah. another podcast. We'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll just get Chuck on. He's still around. He'll tell you the stories. Oh, that's true. That would be fun. Well, let's get to the topic of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Concourse uh, judging, like 101, just just walk us through, because I know Concord judging is a lot different than like Mustang Club of America judging. Like that's, here's how the car was built check these bolts, check these wires, check all this. Concord judging is totally different because you never know what you'll be judging. Mm -hmm. And just walk us through it, you know, kind of the, the three yeah, pages it, or two pages, you know, that kind of stuff. Basically, it's, it's broken down into two incredibly separate categories. You've got what they call French rules, and then you've got mark specific. So if you're judging a Porsche club, they'll give you a multi-multi-page, I don't even know what the page count is today, <laughs> uh, judging sheets. And you're responsible for, say, wheels, nothing else. You just go judge the wheels. And you actually hand their paperwork right back into them, and they take it away. Um, <clears throat> at Ferrari, they've got three sheets. You have either interior, exterior, or engine. And then you're, you go around the car. And I kind of like to work as a team because... As again, you may see something that I don't. So the mark specific stuff. The worst case scenario, of course, is the Corvette Club. <laughs> All 400 pages of you know Bloomington Gold on cars that were mass produced, um, and they are also the kings of crayon marks and everything else that they can fake in there to make them look like they were original. And sometimes <laughs> I won't say any more about that, but you know everybody strives for that Bloomington Gold status, and it's kind of ridiculous in a way. On a car that had, they basically have built so many. What it does, though, is keeps the owners honest in that, you know, there are now more 427 Corvettes built than than the factory made. So, <laughs> so you know, and the whole numbers matching thing. Okay, I get all that. But it is a little ridiculous when you start 
looking at thread count of seatbelts and things like that. It's just, come on guys, it's a car. Um, the other thing is, um, so Mark specific can be pretty, pretty weird. Uh, I, my, my favorite stories, I'll be quick. Uh, I was at a Porsche club event. <clears throat> there were two 356s that showed up at the event with no fluids in them. Tires were wrapped, pedals were wrapped, steering wheels wrapped, seats wrapped. They took everything off and parked the cars on the show field. To me, I wouldn't even judge the cars. <clears throat> they're art, they're not cars. First rule of Ferrari club judging is the car must be driven, preferably driven into the event. So that's the best, you know, that's the best thing. It, it is a car after all, it should start run and drive. These two Porsches could do none of that. All they were, were just over restored cars that, you know, somebody revered and that was it. That's what they did with them. So I, that's why it's, it's kind of tricky when you get into the, ver the, minutia between all the different clubs and how they handle things. Sure. Ferrari, I always thought was the best process, you know, drive the car to the event, you judge it, they don't care, you know, over stone chips or, you know, too many stone chips is one thing, but minor stone chips, if you're driving the car, they don't really care. Dirt in the corners, that's okay too. No white gloves, none of that crap. It's still a car. <clears throat> so moving on, um, French rules, totally different. Basically, what that is is a beauty contest. You'll still have a scoring sheet. The scoring sheet will things like accuracy for the time period, accuracy for uh, <clears throat> for the restoration, things like that. Uh, fit and finish has to be a certain way. But for the most part, it's this one is more beautiful than that one. And you'll find this mostly with um, things like uh, the Villa Desta show, uh, even Pebble Beach to a point. Uh, some other shows that that use French rules because it's it's that was the way they were judged back in the day, back in the early fifties. It was a fashion show. Concours d'Elegance basically was a a parade of elegance. So they would have a fashion show with the cars. So they would bring out all these beautiful Fagoni body Delahays and things, and and they would have you know the women walk with the cars or be in the car as they drove by, and so they judged the car and the and the fashion as well. And uh, that's where all this stuff started when, you know, they were, you know, when you're comparing two of these Art Deco cars, I mean, how do you, of course, they're all perfect mechanically. They all had the, the same, say, Delahaye chassis or Delage chassis. So the engine's a certain way, all that's taken for granted. Now, how do you determine which 100 point car is better than the next? And it's subjective. That's why we have a lot of designers judge that sort of thing because they can pick out certain things. I've judged with designers and they're actually my favorite people to judge with. I love seeing the cars through their eyes. And it's very interesting to see how they see lines on the, on the side of the body. I look at paint, you know, fit and finish. I'm looking at the lines of the gaps. They're right. looking at the lines of the whole car and they go, why does this do this? It looks weird. What? And you just stand back and listen to them talk. And you're like, yeah, now I get it. It's pretty cool. So. Yeah. yeah, and I would also imagine, you know, like, let's talk about like a Pebble Beach specific, you know, if you yeah. have two cars, you know, you're guaranteed they're 100 point cars for the most part, you know, um, yep. that's where, correct me if I'm wrong, but provenance and historic significance will trump rarity. Is that correct? At, at times, um, it depends. I, I'm not, again, back. I, I use my Ferrari background because we don't care how many miles are on the car. We don't care about the story. I don't care who owns it. None of that stuff should play. It's about the car. And they they want to have the car as delivered from the factory. So if your F40 came out and it had green seats, that's the way they want to see the car. Getting back to the Pebble Beach thing, when you're looking again at, at let's say, five of the rarest Ferraris in the world, it then becomes very subjective. Which car has the most presence or elegance factor or... Um, and if you're judging like last year, there was a class of 917s. Okay, well, it's a 917. Probably every one of them has been wrecked, repainted and rebuilt at some point. Uh, you know, the Le Mans winner in 70 uh, was, was the Salzburg car, which was red with white stripes. The next year, it was completely silver with martini stripes. It's like, okay. So the car is back to its original form, but does that make it better? I don't know. But again, now you're looking at provenance. This one won, you know, won Le Mans, then it won this race and that race and that race and all, on and on and on. Maybe that's got some weight to it. But um, I will say this, that whatever class you're judging, the cream rises to the top. 
as soon as you're walking down that row of eight cars, sometimes 10 cars, you know right away the top three immediately. Sometimes you'll know the best one right away yeah. too. Because you, um, it's, it's not uncommon now to get your cars ahead of time, maybe a week ahead of time and things like that, especially when you're at Pebble or at a Mark specific show or you're doing say race car class in Ferrari. So you want to get all that information about the car ahead of time so you know what you're looking at. Uh, and they do that. But um, even so, you'll know immediately as soon as you walk down that row, that's a contender. That's a contender right away. It's and funny so, you say that. Yeah, because yeah. at Yurkin Corso, I knew right away the winning car in my mind. And it mm -hmm. was the car that, I mean, we were doing later supercars, but in that class, I was like, well, there it is right there. You know, I hadn't even judged it yet. I could just tell, you know, it was a low mileage example, super rare, one of one colors were nuts. You know, the car I'm talking about the yellow. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. yeah. And yep. I, I just knew that was it. As soon as I saw it, now you go back and you look at the total of the seven cars, you judge all seven, you, you look at what you did for each and you look at them. Is that car better than that car? You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, that one was hands down the winner for that class. Yeah, you'll find it right away. Um, but more importantly, it's like uh, it's all in the preparation too. You know, the car has a certain presence that the other ones don't. And I can't describe that, but you know, as soon as, you know, like I said, I mean, I judged uh, an ESO class in, in Monterey at, at Pebble Beach. And, uh, you know, the car that really stood out was ESO Grifo prototype. It's one of one. And when you Wasn't saw that the car, a stunning color on that car, yeah, it was like a, for lack of a better explanation, that's exactly what I was going to hit on is the color drew you immediately. I couldn't like get my gray, eyes off that thing. Yeah. It's like a gray green. So yeah. it was sort of a, a light metallic gray with a hint of green and a hint of blue with a silver top. And it all kind of, it looked like, and it was their show car. They took it to Geneva, Torino. That's where it debuted. It was the prototype. So when you saw the car, it had this, this feel to it that no other car had on the field in that especially in that group it's pretty cool it was that car you could tell it was a winner from 50 feet away there was like there was no, no doubt that thing was unbelievable yeah spectacular sure. and great great restoration beautiful interior even the interior had these weird perforations in the seats and things like that that only that car had i mean when you open the door you just you know everything was bespoke it was all just made for the show so they wanted to bring their best foot forward. And obviously, you know, they continued that when they did the restoration. Uh, again, when you're judging, let's say these French cars, you'll know. I mean, there are some that are, you'll see them in the, some of these Art Deco cars, especially the Fagoni cars where, um, where they're completely skirted all the way around. And they have this big, you know, swoopy fenders and things like that. That may not be the winner because you'll see something next to it that may be one of one that has, it's the only one built without those spats and it just looks, uh, maybe it looks better. I don't know. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It's, yes. it's really, it's, it's really interesting. It's that's, that's the fun part of doing judging. And it's also why you have teams. So, so that, okay. So as a team, you're looking at the car collectively. Right. Right. So he might like the blue one. She might like the red one, but the winner should be the white one. You and know, that's that why you always have the conversations, you know, after the cars while it's fresh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're at Pebble Beach. The cars are going to be 99 to 100 points regardless. So you're, you're already, all the T's are dotted, all the, you know, all, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. And it's supposed to look the certain way. So when you open the hood, you know that the hose clamps and things, you, you, you can confirm it, of course. But at the same time, you know that most of these guys went through the effort to make it just right. So then it just comes down to what, what car looks the best, which is the best prepared, which is the, the nicest finish, or could be a color. I mean, color will draw you initially, but then the overall shape brings you together. You know, it's pretty cool. Getting back to color, a lot of times the cars are painted in modern paint. So they get the fleck wrong. They get the, the paint chip shape wrong or whatever, too metallic uh, or not enough metallic. I mean, there's a, there's a fine line there. And that, that also will draw you in. Like that car, that's just the wrong color. Like you would never see that color in 1938, you know, or whatever. Right. It just didn't right. exist. You know, yeah. it's a modern Cadillac color, but they painted their, you know, their Delahaye that color. Whoops. Um, <clears throat> I actually worked on a Maserati. It was an A6 uh, GCS convertible. 
had two very or three very important things uh, associated. One, it was uh, Juan Perón's car, so Eva Perón. So that was one thing. The second thing was, the interior was lambskin suede. No kidding. Wow. Light gray, lambskin suede, the most incredible interior I've ever worked on. Um, it was like butter, you know, it's just the, so soft and, and, you know, it had that, the, the suede was very low nap. It was just amazing. And then the outside, the paint was this unusual teal green color mm. that was chosen in period. And when they first did it, when they first made this paint, they actually hand ground the uh, metallic chip with a mortar and pestle to get the exact shape and size of metallic chip they wanted oh my goodness wow just to give you an idea and it, yeah. it was again a show car it's one of those things where they wanted to put their best foot forward so they came out with this crazy color and interior combination very cool that is very cool well one thing i want to do and and i want to record this after this episode so we're, we're okay. I, you're a twofer you don't know this yet but you're a twofer <laughs> so i've got two cars that i know of that i think can win Pebble Beach this year. And I want to get your opinion on these two cars. I want to record it after this, okay. but I'm not going to, obviously it's all secret right now, but I want to, um, after Monterey, I want to put it out there and see how accurate we were. See if you torpedo my guesses or not. Okay. And um, see how it goes. Cause one thing I find fascinating is I went on the docent tour a couple of years ago um, mm -hmm. for Pebble Beach and our docent actually picked out the car that was going to win on the tour. Very knowledgeable guy. And he said, you know, he just basically said that car's going to win. And my God, he was right. <laughs> yeah. And I know last year, the, uh, the special Duesenberg that won, that was just an insane car. How often do you, do you show up as a judge at a major concourse like that? And you already know the best to show winner, just from your own knowledge, from the description of the car, the historical, everything we just talked about. No, I've, picked them before uh sometimes the thing about pebble is uh when those three cars roll up at the end and they pick the one that's going to win and not necessarily one you picked which is kind of interesting yeah uh, a couple of years ago we had a car that i thought was certainly a contender but ended up win finishing second so it wasn't too bad uh but it's interesting now that they're using like uh, the 375 mm that the Rossellini car being a post-war car being best of show. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important because, you know, there've been some great cars built since, since the war. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, again, you know, you have a feeling and it's kind of funny. Uh, there are certain cars that, that you also know will not win. And, mm. I, and that's a, because of my position and what I do, uh, I see cars in restoration shops or I know about cars that are being restored right now that are going to Pebble Beach, but I can tell you that they won't win right. because of certain things that, you know, they're rebodied or they're modified or there's something different about them that, that won't allow them to win at least a best of show. Right. Uh, they may win their class, but it may not be best of show. Best example I can give you of that was there was a, I'm trying to think of the, it was a one-off body uh, Cadillac that showed up a couple of years ago as big as a house. I mean, this thing was huge. I can't remember the name of it. Art Deco car built in the thirties and it, it was just massive. Well, the owner, uh, it was once painted bright red and now it's currently painted this cream color. And the owner was dead set that he was going to win best of show. The car, I don't think it even won its class, but I mean, mm -hmm. everyone who saw that car, everyone, that's going to be best to show. Look at that thing. It's huge. It's beautiful. It's elegant. It's this, it's that. I found the car unattractive myself. Like the front end was ungainly. Um, and it really came down to, it was not the right colors. It wasn't the right restoration. And the car just didn't, it, it right. was, it was almost like an inflated version of a really great car. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> it, was just, it was just too big and too uh, you know, uh, ungainly to win. Right. So, right. Yeah. But everybody had a peg. Oh, that's going to win. You're like, okay, you wait, right. just wait to see what happens. That's all. <laughs> it is wow. fun though. It's, it's fun to also speculate when you see that, you know, you take the lap around and you yeah. see all the cars in the field and you go, Oh yeah, I bet you it's going to be that one. Yeah. Maybe not. So let's take it back a step here. Cause I know there's probably a lot of folks that would love to be Concord judges, but don't know the yeah. first step 
you know, how do I get involved? Uh, what would your advice be? Join a club. That's the first thing. Um, and especially in your, your particular area, a lot of clubs like our Philadelphia region of uh, our Penn Jersey region of the Ferrari club, we have two Concord events every year. We have one in New Jersey, yeah. the garden state, and we have our Pennsylvania Concorso. So with that, it gave, gives you two opportunities to judge. Also go to a show and speak to a judge. Uh, we have the Rider Hunt Concord here in Philly. And that's always the easiest way to get involved is to say, hey, I want to do this. Well, come out and they'll and maybe make you a shadow for a day or two, you know, for the, uh, the first time you go out there. And then you can see the process. You can sit in on the judges meeting. You see the sheets and the scoring and how we do it. And then and maybe you want to get more involved and we'll get you on the list and keep building it up. And that's really how it works. Um, attend a concours and ask questions. That's the right. easiest way. Yeah, that's and good then, advice. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, once you get into the loop we're always looking for judges by the way so don't think that you don't have a chance because we really need judges a lot of them unfortunately are for lack of a better term timing out right yeah some of the judges at pebble beach uh you know there are three or four that will not be returning this year because they passed away or you know they're or they're just able to do it they're in their mid to late 80s and just don't get around so yeah, it's when you're the when you're 50 years old and you're called the young gun, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you get that's some exactly blood right. We're looking for we're looking for some younger blood out there to to judge cars. You're wow, look at you. You're under 60. You're you're the man. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're the hired. Man. You know, it is yeah. funny. And I know so, there are some programs like Haggerty obviously has the youth youth judging program, and I'm here in Cincinnati and Cincinnati Concor. It's one of the yeah. biggest groups of the youth judges, and you see all these kids running around with their score sheets. Really cool, really awesome um, for them to get involved that early in that way. I wish I had done something like that way back in the day. So, yeah, it, it's the, the easiest thing to do, though, is to get involved, just to ask questions, but join a club. Um, one of the things I like to do, I'm chief judge for our, our region, and I do uh, judging seminars two, three times a year. So, mm. we get together in a body shop, we get a couple of Ferraris in there, and we'll literally score them, judge them. And that also is a nice thing to attend. And you can see right then and there, if you really think this is something you want to do, great. If not, no, you know, it's a free event, right. but it's only to Ferrari club members. So, right. Yeah. Um, awesome. I personally, the reason I chose that, as I said, is, is their format's really good. I like the fact that the car has to be driven. Uh, it's very realistic. You know, it's, you know, if you have, uh, the big, like the biggest thing on a modern car is they replace the exhaust. They put a 2B or, or one of those right. aftermarket yeah. exhausts in the car. Well, of course you're going to lose points. It's not how the car was delivered. One of the issues we're having though, is we need people to, to judge modern cars. Uh, the old timers, they don't want to have anything to do with anything since 1990. So anything prior to that, they're good with like around to the 308, let's say. Right. And, uh, but anything newer than that, they don't want any part of it. They don't even want to look at it. Yeah, And uh, I got to right. tell you, you know, think about this, uh, 308s, almost 40 years old. Yeah. yeah actually, yeah. it is 40 years old. So, think, you know, it's crazy when you think about it. That is that pretty cool. That you saw on, on Magnum that was yeah. new at the time, it's 40 years old. Yeah. When I was at Cavalino this year, I helped judge the Classic K, which was kind of a last minute deal, you know, and, but I, I loved it. I really thought it was really cool because you're, you're looking at, you know, do you have your Classic K book? Uh, what was interesting about that is, is, you know, like, what did you have to do to get the book? You know, like what wasn't originally you had to fix that kind of stuff. So that was a whole new experience for me. And that was more modern cars. We did quite a few F40s and, you know, Enzo's yeah. and whatever. So that was, that was kind of cool and fun uh, curveball at the last second, but I did enjoy it. So was yeah. there anything else? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I have a great classic a story. Okay. Uh, you know, to gain a, a classic a red book, it's a, it's a pretty involved process. Um, I have uh, one of my clients restored. Uh, I'll, I'll keep the story short because there's much more to it than this, but it's kind of funny. Uh, a, uh, the first 250 GT California. So mm -hmm. long wheelbase, covered headlight, California. My dream car. Rosa no. Rubino. Uh, the, the side note to this is this gentleman who owns this 330 owned that car at one time and sold it because he didn't like the way it drove, uh, sold it for a little over $800,000 for his 18 plus million dollar car. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> but he made a home run. Yeah, but you know, hindsight being 2020 should have held onto it. Anyway, so the car was restored and they did a classic K book on it. And the really 
this is something I've never seen. I judge classic a book uh, like you did. Never seen this before. They, there was a letter that came with it. And in the letter, it stated that we found some pictures. The owner, the original owner of the car was a friend of Enzo's. And when he took delivery of the car, he took pictures that day of him and his girlfriend driving around in the car. So it came with- Not his wife, his girlfriend. Right, or whatever, you know, I'm not <laughs> yeah. saying. I'm not one to judge, especially in Italy. So we have, uh, they sent us, they sent him negatives, pictures, and a letter stating that this is this guy and when he bought the car and everything else. But when you, the last two pages of the classic A book were the pictures printed in the book of that guy taking delivery, then driving to some, you know, wood, uh, uh, you know, uh, tree lined road and took pictures there and the girlfriend on the car and all that stuff. And they put them all in the classic K book and never told the owner he was getting it. Wow. So when they cut the book, he sees the letter. He's like, what the hell? So he opens it up. He's flipping through. And there's those pictures that Classic Cape found and put him in for. That's that incredible. Such yeah. a cool thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. You know what? If you have a significant Ferrari and you have some period photographs, if you're lucky, it's mm -hmm. nothing compared to what they probably have on the car. You know, right. just their archives are so deep. Uh, yeah, in for, fact, you know, he really got lucky. They found the right guy who who took the time to find them and do that for him as well. That's the other thing. I mean, that probably will not happen at Porsche. <laughs> so, so I got to ask you. I'm six feet tall. My uh, yep. one of my absolute favorite cars in the world is, I would assume, a long wheelbase. You know, fifty nine. You know, Cali Spider. Uh, would I enjoy driving it? Could I sit in it comfortably? I was told I could not fit in one of those. Well, uh, we drove. Uh, we drove the Shoro base version, which is my personal favorite, um, to Pebble Beach. And uh, I drove in passenger seat. My friend drove, he's six one. He drove in the driver's seat. No. no problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's actually very comfortable. I'll um, keep, I'll keep you, striving. You do, now, it's a 50s car. So there's a couple of things you need to know. One is you sit bolt upright. Two, yes. uh, it sounds wonderful. It has no brakes. Uh, mm. Steering is heavy and awful. Um, it's a 50s car and it drives like a 50s car and it drives okay i mean it's not bad but you know the later stuff like this 330 that drives really well and as you get into more modern stuff it's what you're accustomed to as well yeah. you know don't expect it to be you know have the dynamics of say an f50 it's going to be even though it was the fastest thing in the time it's not going to be like that at all yeah so, wow it's, it's an old car was well, there anything else you wanted to cover as far as concord judging yeah, so getting back to the judging thing, we get all, all, all these side notes and tangents. That's typically what happens when I do these things. Um, yeah, just uh, get involved. And, and you'll find that if it's something you're interested in, you should definitely do it. Now, if you're more interested, say, in, uh, uh, say, muscle cars or 50s cars. So you have an affinity. For, uh, uh, another quick side note. Uh, one of my favorite things, uh, being in the F1, McLaren F1 world, I've talked, I've Spent a lot of time with Gordon Murray. And a uh, little known fact, he has two 1950s generation uh, American cars that he set up in, a, in his barn with a drive-in movie theater, mm. a 57 T-Bird and a 59 Cadillac. And when I Great first cars. talked about these things, I said, 50, uh, a 57 T-Bird, okay, so you're Gordon Murray. Like, why? He said, I always liked the car. I thought it was cool. But he wanted to do this thing with the drive-in. So I thought that was pretty neat. But anyway, uh, those kind of cars, uh, I would look into things like the AACA. Uh, they have a great program. They have judging seminars. They have judging teams. And they, they do a, a really interesting, uh, like their score sheets make a lot of sense. And you'll be able to judge things, uh, 50s, 60s, mostly American, or pre-war, which is kind of cool. And they're always looking for people to, to join up and help judge. So it's a very... It's not as formal as, say, Porsche or Corvette, which are on the extreme. Uh, probably not as formal even as Ferrari, but still, because they're not mark specific, but they are mark related. You have, you know, you you have to know. Like, if you're an expert in Mustang, you're going to be judging Mustangs, is what I'm thinking. Yeah. But having getting the general knowledge, and I always tell people when I do these seminars, it's the same thing: suck, squish, bang, blow. It's still a car. You know, it could be. It could be, um, I just worked on a GTO, it could be $80 million, or it could be, you know, a $7,000 gremlin. It doesn't matter because you're looking at the same thing. You're looking at fit, finish, 
is the car the right color for its period? It's painted in, you know, flip-flop pearl metallic from, you know, Mystic from a Ford Mustang on a on a 68, you know, whatever, you know, things like that. It's all in, you know, the the interior is done in fur or naga hide or or right. you know, or worse, you know, or if it's got really goofy things like spoilers or wings that shouldn't have been there from the factory, like the RWB crap, um, any of that stuff. It's like you can. You know, that's the stuff. It's all about the basics. Look at what it is overall. And generally, if you're on a team, someone on your team is going to know the minutia. They're going to know the hose clamp. They're going to know the bolt pattern or the bolt. Right. They're right. going to know the finishes. And that's not what you need to focus on. Just get the basics. Learn about what a car should look like. You know, door should fit a certain way. It shouldn't be jacked out unless it's a Corvette, you know, or or in, in this, I'm not being derogatory to Corvettes, but there is a certain level of over restoration, as you know, uh, when they sand the bodywork perfectly flat and it doesn't have any orange peel and all that kind of stuff. So it becomes an over restored issue because those cars were never like that. Uh, I have a picture on my screen here of an F40. That's in the same vein. Uh, you can tell an F40 has been painted when you can't see the grain yes, of the Kevlar yeah. coming through. Yeah. And that's what judges look for. So yeah, it's that sort of stuff. You don't necessarily have to know specific, but you have to know general. And that's uh, the best way to get involved. That's yeah, fun. that reminds me of the 53 Corvette. If you don't see the fiberglass showing through. Exactly. You know, yeah. 54, they fixed it, 53. So I got to go back here a second. What does yeah, sure. WRB stand for? Oh, RWB? RWB. Yeah, uh, uh, Rao Velt, uh, uh, what is it, Rao? I can't remember. <laughs> it, basically what it is, it's one guy. I'm probably going to get shot for this, but I'll I'll be the one to do it. It's one Japanese guy. His name is Akira. Akira's claim to fame is smoking an entire pack of cigarettes while cutting a 911 Fender well uh, uh, out with a with a sawzall. I know who you're and, talking about. Okay, yep. and then riveting riveting uh, fiberglass flares on it and putting a suspension kit in it so the car is lowered with super wide wheels and tires. In other words, um, in my opinion, ruining a nice 911, basically. He does nothing to, to mitigate the bare metal that he just cut away, that just sits there and slaps this thing on top and then rivets it in place. And that's so, really ex his that whole movement exploded in Japan, right? Like it's really nuts. It, so, yeah, there's also other companies. Almost. Yeah, there's other companies doing this. Uh, Liberty Walk is probably yep. the most famous. Um, but RWB, his uh, uh, his his stuff is just so you can watch his videos online. You you watch him literally hack a car to death, and then screw on these flares, and the owners are like, "Oh my god, it's an art! Oh, it's the greatest!" Okay, <laughs> if yeah. you think so, whatever. You know, it's, I just stand back and look at it and think of how that 911 was so nice before they cut it, yeah. you know, but what do I know? You know, I do have to mention the reason I got into judging initially was I was trying to find a Mustang. So I joined the Mustang club. Yeah. If there's a car you like, you know, join the club now, you know, learn more about it. So I started judging, not necessarily to judge, but I wanted to know what was right. So I went out there to buy my car. I knew what was wrong when I saw it. And so one example yeah. I'll give, you know, if you look at a 65 Mustang and it has a 66 grill, it's got a, a repopped front bumper, you know, there's some clues real quick that it was in a front end collision at some point. You know? right, exactly. Yeah. So I joined just so I would know what was right. So when I saw something, when I wanted to buy a car, I knew what was wrong. And even still I got burns, but you know, it's a learning process. <laughs> well, there are, there are also some perks involved. So if you do get to a, a higher level, you get to judge at some of the bigger events, say Amelia or Greenwich or, well, let's just use, you know, Amelia and, and Pebble are the two premier concours in the country, basically. But right. there are a number of second tier shows like Greenwich and, you know, Hillsboro or even Cincinnati and things like that. But, you know, they treat you well as a judge. Sometimes you'll get, you know, hotel rooms. Sometimes you get, well, you always get fed, which is nice. You always get tickets, which is also nice. So, you know, have invite somebody to come along and, join the club and have fun. You know, that's always a good thing. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Tim. I do want to oh. record this next fun part to see how accurate we are. We'll post it after Monterey, but I appreciate your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Sorry, I ramble a lot, but it's, uh, it comes with the territory basically.
Usually the, that's why I wanted you on the podcast. You were so entertaining in the judges meeting. I said, this guy has got to be on the podcast and <laughs> thanks. You delivered. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>